Good evening and welcome everyone. I'm Lisa Oldham, the Library Director. I am so pleased to welcome you all to the sixth annual Conversations with Business Leaders. We are so delighted to have Mr. Jaffe here tonight. I am going to quickly hand over to Hazel Hobbs, who is the convener of the committee who organizes this annual event. Can I ask you all to please turn your mobile phones either down or off? And without anything further, I'll turn over to Hazel. And we'll have volume for everyone else. I appreciate that. My voice isn't that loud, so I appreciate it. Just closer. Can you hear me all right in the back? Okay, good. If you can't, just raise your hand and I'll know. Thank you. Testing. Testing two. Okay. Oh, good. Thank you. The purpose of Conversations with Business Leaders lecture series is to keep the community informed about the state of the economy and business. Speakers present their views on current and expected trends and concerns affecting the business they represent and share their leadership, organizational, and management expertise as gleaned over the course of their careers. The speakers selected to speak are accomplished business leaders who have a reputation for excellence. Topics cover the broad gamut of business leadership, issues including ethical decision making, innovative thinking, and organizational performance. Our speakers have been Bob Slurd, who is here today. Bob, would you raise your hand? And <laughs> we'll recognize <laughs> the fan club's meeting today. Uh, chairman of Saatchi and Saatchi, author of Start with the Answer. George Bodenheimer, co-chairman, Disney Media Med Networks, president of ESPN and ABC Sports. Jeffrey Emmel, chairman and CEO of General Electric. David Calhoun, global head of private equity Perfor for portfolio operations at Blackstone and concurrently executive chair of the Nielsen Company. And Chase Carey, president of S and COO of News Corp. Our organizational committee includes our former speakers, George Moore, Lisa Oldham, and myself, and most importantly, James M. Citron. Jim Citron leads Spencer Stewart's North American CEO practice. During his 20 years with the firm, he has completed 550 CEO, board director, CFO, and other management searches. Jim is a noted expert on leadership, governance, and professional success recognized as an influential leader in corporate governance and a published author of three books on leadership. Here to introduce Conversations with Business Leaders Speaker of 2014, Jim Citron. Thank you, Hazel. Good afternoon. Um, apologies for my my inappropriate attire, uh, as I told David, I raced down from Dartmouth uh, from parents, freshman parents weekend, and I just made it with about seven minutes to spare. So uh, apologize, but I'm really happy to be here and introduce my very, very good personal friend, David Jaffe, who has a great career and has built a truly remarkable company that he'll tell us all about. Uh, David, as many of you who know David know, it's a, it's a great local story. He grew up in Stamford and went to Wharton undergraduate at University of Pennsylvania, graduated in 1981, and after a few years on Wall Street, went back to Stanford Business School, class of 85, returned to Wall Street at Chemical Bank when they had a very, uh, very leading edge private equity firm and uh, as a partner there. And in 2002, I'm sorry, in 1992, David left Chemical and joined what was then Dress Barn and uh, he became CEO, president and CEO 10 years later. The story of Dress Barn, which is now a scene of retail, is something I'm sure David will tell us all about and we'll learn a lot about it and how he thinks about the company and about retail. But what you should know and, uh, is that the company is close to a $5 billion company, uh, $4.7 billion in 2013. Uh, it's got about 4,000 stores in the U.S. and in Canada, 50,000 associates, uh, and a close to $3 billion market capitalization. But back to the local point, uh, the company is a great uh, New Canaan area, Stanford story. It was founded in 1962, 
as Dress Barn by David's mom, Roz, and co-founded by his dad, Elliot. And as I have learned the story, it's a great story, 1962 was the time when women were just starting to come into the workforce and they really didn't have a lot of options as to what to wear. And so she saw a very big need to have everyday working uh, attire to be available to women and on the basis of that, Dress Barn was created. Um, in, uh, I guess it was in 19, uh, sorry, it was in, two, in, in the mid-2000s uh, when David uh, took over as CEO, they started a series of acquisitions and they've acquired a number of different brands and then they reflagged the, the company from Dress Barn to a Cena retail group. One of the great things about David and his, on another great personal friend, David's wife, Helen, who many of you know, they are incredibly generous and philanthropic uh, individuals. Helen herself is a tremendous leader. She serves on the board of Kinglow Haywood School, having served on the board of St. Luke's. And they've got their great parents. They've got four amazing kids, only one of whom could be here. And I won't embarrass you, Laurel, uh, in the back doing her homework. That's why she's always top of her class and the most successful at everything she does. Uh, but again, I won't point Laurel out to embarrass her. <laughs> but that's her in the back, Laurel, you can wave. Uh, um, but similar to David and Helen's values of uh, philanthropy individually and giving back the company, one of the things you just, it doesn't take a lot of research to see the incredible community engagement that this company does. And the list goes on from uh, partnering with the American Cancer Society and doing a lot in breast cancer juvenile, I'm sorry, in, in American diabetes, uh, also in helping this dress for success as something to help empower uh, women in the workforce. So it's a, it's a great example of personal leadership, corporate leadership, family leadership, and all aligned. And uh, I just couldn't be more proud to be able to introduce my very, very good personal friend, uh, David Jaffe. Thank you. Well, with that introduction, I guess this can go really, really fast. I can just throw out the first few pages. Um, thank you. It's, it's uh, really nice to be here. Nice to have this opportunity. Hazel, uh, great setting it up. Thank you uh, for coming, George. Um, and thank you all for, for joining us on a, on a beautiful Sunday afternoon. Uh, I'll do a brief presentation, and then at the end, we'll switch into Q&A. So you can hold your questions, but I definitely would like to hear what's on your mind and your, your thoughts. Um, some of this may be repetitive, but uh, just to run through it again quickly, I am uh, a local, um, although we didn't get into New Canaan uh, until about 11 years ago. Uh, I was born in Stanford, uh, graduated from high school. Uh, my parents still live in Stanford, so every now and then we get dragged over for uh, an, an event or what have you. Um, what uh, was interesting, uh, Helen grew up in Armonk, which is just down the road, but we didn't meet until we both moved into New York um, after uh, working for a while. We, uh, we moved out when we started to have kids, uh, and we've been out here, as I say, for about 11 years. Our kids went through country school. Uh, the two older ones went to King, I'm sorry, went to St. Luke's, and then on to Penn, and that's when Helen went on the board. I was also on the board at, at New Canaan Country School. Uh, now, Laurel and her, her big brother are a king. Um, Russell uh, couldn't be here, uh, but he's off to Oberlin next year, so we're very proud of him, but disappointed a little bit maybe that he's not going to Penn to keep the tradition going. Um, in, in addition to some of the things that uh, Jimmy mentioned, uh, we do uh, believe, Helen, I do believe it's really important uh, to give back to the community. And so uh, before we moved here, we were in Weston, uh, and I was on the board of, of, of uh, Devil's Den, uh, I was involved with Stepping Stones on the board there before they even broke ground um, on the new museum, uh, which is just not so new anymore. It's been a wonderful success story. Um, and in addition, I'm still involved with the Connecticut chapter of the Nature Conservancy, some of you may be aware of. Um, and uh, one of our passions uh, is food allergy. Um, as some of you may know, four of our kids uh, have food allergy. Actually, Laurel uh, just outgrew her food allergies, which we're very excited about. Uh, but the other three haven't, and, and having to deal with that uh, uh, 20 years ago when it wasn't really so popular uh, was really a labor of love uh, uh, by both Helen locally and myself uh, on a more national level. So that organization continues and has grown, and we're very, very proud of that. 
Um, Helen serves uh, as the chair of Fair Connecticut, um, in addition to um, St. Luke's and uh, the Fund for Women and Girls. Uh, she's um, just been in, in involved around town uh, in, in any way she can. She's, she's had the luxury of being able to watch our four kids grow and, and, and help them through all their trials and tribulations of adolescence. Um, so maybe I'll switch and, and talk just a minute about my career and try to make it really short. I started out, my first job uh, out of college uh, was on Wall Street. Um, I went to Penn, I was in Wharton, and I had a, a dual degree uh, in biology, and kind of incongruous combination. So I just went into one of these training programs uh, at Merrill Lynch, um, ended up in the uh, buy side uh, for fixed income. Some of you may have heard of the Merrill Lynch Ready Assets Trust, the money market area. Um, and, and after about a year, I realized this was not what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. So I had the good fortune of going back to business school. Um, and when I got there, uh, this is um, at Stanford, it was in the hotbed of venture capital. So I was able to meet people and take classes and really caught the bug. So after uh, business school, during my, two year, my internship um, summer job, and then after, uh, I worked at Chemical Venture Partners. In fact, the, the former founding head of it, Steve Gilbert, uh, lives in New Canaan. Some of you may know him. Um, so uh, that really gave me a great sense of uh, the opportunities that were out there. Uh, and it wasn't just saying, well, this business exists and we're just going to make it bigger. It was trying to come up with brand new ideas. Uh, and I spent most of my time in consumer, in retail. And three of the businesses you may have heard of, uh, we, we funded very, very early on. Uh, Office Depot, when they had two stores. And we watched that one grow. And obviously, it's been a huge, huge uh, growth vehicle. Um, in addition, um, there are other companies uh, like Gymboree uh, and Petco that we funded. This is 25 plus years ago when they were very, very small companies. So then I, I decided that I didn't want to be just an investor anymore. I wanted to actually be the guy driving the train. Uh, and I figured the only way to do that was to learn how to run a business. And because of my family's involvement with Dress Barn, I had this unique opportunity to go work there. Uh, unbeknownst to me, when my father said, come and work, uh, you know, take five years, I'll retire, it'll be all yours, you'll be ready. Ten years later, I'm kind of scratching my head, and now 22 years later, God bless him, he's still our non-executive chairman, so it's really wonderful to have him around, but he doesn't really meddle with the day-to-day -day anymore. Um, so, so maybe just for a moment before I, I uh, transition, um, it's important to look back at your career sometimes and, and try and figure out how did you get where you got? And I thought it was interesting to connect the dots uh, on my three jobs. Um, at Merrill, uh, even though it was a job I, I really didn't enjoy, I learned about the macro environment. Uh, I learned about economic cycles. I learned about timing. Then when I went to uh, uh, Chemical Venture Partners, I learned about new businesses. I learned about the importance of investing in management in people that could really execute and not just a great idea. Um, and I also learned about developing strategy. Uh, when I got to Dress Barn for the first 10 years, I probably had every job you could have. Every six months, my father would say, oh, okay, well, you did a nice job there. Now go do this. Now try this project. Everybody's seen that, that commercial where they give the little kid, you know, let Mikey try it? Well, it, that, I was Mikey. When anybody, any executive had something they didn't want to do, they just gave it to me. So it was a really great learning uh, experience for, for 10 years. So then when I, I took the helm, I was able to bring all of those experiences together. Uh, and it's really influenced the way I think about uh, Dress Bar now as Cena, uh, and the opportunity that I saw for our businesses um, in the marketplace. So maybe now what I'd like to do is just give you a quick video that talks about uh, Asina and, and who we are, and then we'll go from there. OK. I'm doing something wrong. Have you advanced it manually?
All right. Well, that's a quick overview on Asena. Um, and maybe as we think about Asena, it operates in the context um, of a, a very challenging retail landscape. So what I'd like to do is talk about the changes. When you think back, uh, retail was not the most exciting place uh, for, uh, for most people to think about innovation and, and technology and change for many, many years. Um, and if you look back, these are actually, some of you may re remember, everyone knows this picture. Does anybody remember G.C. Murphy? Some, some nods here. And I'm not sure where that picture is. Anybody know the corner there? Anyway, my assistant found all these great shots of New Canaan. Um, so uh, that's the way it used to be. And when you think about what's happened in retail, there's this major disruptor that we like talking about, which is the Internet. And it's affected many, many businesses, but I don't think any more so than, than the retail industry, both because of the Internet and the ease of access to information and all that, but also because of e-commerce. Now people could go online and with a click, uh, they could get virtually everything that they could get by going into a store. So that became a, a has become a real challenge for us. But if we step back, let's look at the industry uh, through the ages, or, or what we call the, uh, the three major waves uh, of retail. So back probably around the uh, mid-1800s to right around the war, uh, the power really rested with the manufacturers. Um, Distribution was slow, there were only a few department stores, there really weren't any specialty stores, uh, and it was kind of the old uh, Henry Ford, you can have any color you want as long as it's black. So all the power was with the producers, and the retailers were just kind of a link uh, in the distribution chain. Um, and there wasn't really anything exciting about them, um, and so uh, over time, um, people were just happy to get the product uh, because it was a producer-driven business industry um, and not a, a demand-driven uh, business. So then we hit wave two, and that kind of started after the war. People came back and, and they wanted products, they wanted goods and merchandise. Um, you had the development of the interstate highway system, suburbs that led to shopping centers, the big malls. And so then you had really smart retailers beginning to carve out niches for themselves. So Walmart says, we sell for less. Uh, Gap developed probably one of the very first lifestyle retailers. If you want to look cool like whoever it is in their ads, come, come get the one pocket tee and the jeans and you've got the whole look. Um, and then Home Depot became uh, one of the early category killers. So now you had people, retailers, thinking about the industry differently. They said, hey, the, the producers don't really deserve all the power. We're the conduit. We're the last step before it reaches the consumer. Why don't we take control and come up with a model that's going to attract those consumers in? So they were creating demand, um, and it became now more marketing-driven. Uh, and as a result, you had this big wave. A lot of the old companies uh, that weren't able to adapt, uh, like the G.C. Murphys, like the Montgomery Wards, uh, went out of business. And so now here we are, and it's wave three. So now the, sh the power has shifted from the retailer to the consumer. The consumer has ultimate flexibility because she can go wherever she or he would like to to get that product. We have stores everywhere. We have more retail space. We're more overstored um, by many multiples than any other country uh, in the world. In addition, the ease of entry uh, to the internet, to setting up a website, uh, is, is very, very low. Um, lots of availability of capital, lots of, of talent out there that can help you get going. And so now there's a website, an e-commerce site, for just about everything under the sun, which creates a very, very difficult environment. If you're selling a product that now someone has taken into their little niche on their website and they're selling it for less, because they have very, very little overhead, if any, think about it, when you have a website, you don't have to pay rent for your store. You don't have to pay the associates that work in the store. So the whole model uh, changes. Um, at this point, uh, we see e-commerce growing around 20% a year. Um, and it's uh, got about 10% penetration into retail sales. Obviously, there's some behemoths out there like Amazon 
but there are a lot, a lot of little companies. Um, let me uh, contrast that with pure brick and mortar, brick and mortar being stores. Um, growth is probably about flat at best. So you've got one going really fast and another one that's, that's pretty much stagnant. And that's this, this channel migration because people say, gee, why do I need to go to the bookstore when I can just go to Amazon and with one click I can get everything I want and it's at a good price. And while Barnes & Noble still hangs on uh, and a few little uh, boutiques like Elm Street Books, uh, you've seen companies, big companies like Borders, uh, go out of business. Same thing with the Circuit City. Now you just have um, uh, 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 Best Buy, <coughs> excuse me, still out there competing uh, and Circuit City having dropped away because of the competition. So when we think about it uh, internally, uh, we think that, you know, we started out as a single channel retailer. We had stores, people came to our stores and they shopped. And then it started changing. Uh, and then we had catalogs, um, and then we had e-commerce, and people could kind of go to their catalog and look at it and order. Or they go online, you know, their laptop and order, or they go to the store. Now, what, what's changed everything and what we're calling omnichannel is this little gizmo. So now, wherever you are, you can get access to any of the information that you get by going in the store, by going online, or by looking at your catalog. And the com customer is demanding this transparency, this, this flow of information and consistent information from one channel to the other. So what we've had to do as retailers uh, is be able to react to that and be able to present that customer with her option. So here's an interesting question. When, when you go online uh, and you think, okay, I'm going to go buy a car, how many people do you think shop online before they buy a car? A lot. 95%. Okay? Makes sense. It's a big purchase. A lot of information is out there, a way to educate yourself. So in fashion, you say, well, you know, what does it matter? You're going to go in the store, you're going to try it on. What percent of people do you think pre-shop? 10, 20? 70 percent. 70 percent of our customers and the industry, there have been numerous surveys, are going online to shop to see what the deal is, to see what the new fashion is, to compare one store versus another so they can figure out where should they, they should go shopping first. So you've got a tremendous challenge to make sure your website looks terrific. But it's an also a big opportunity because I, as a retailer, as an omnichannel retailer, can give that customer the opportunity to go to my store. My stores, depending on the brand, had been around 40, 60, 100 years for Lane Bryant. And so there's a lot of credibility with that brand. If she orders something online and it doesn't fit or she doesn't like it, doesn't want, want a different color, she can just bring it in that store. In fact, what we do, we offer her the option of shipping it directly to the store for her to pick up free shipping so she saves the charges. If it doesn't fit her, she can exchange it right there so it makes it hassle-free. So you get the customers coming in the store, but now you're engaging her across those different channels. And the same thing in reverse, if she comes in the store and by chance we don't have her size or color, we can get it for her online and we can ship it to her home free. Or we can ship it back to the store and next time she comes in, we can put together that and maybe some other pieces to go with it. So I think as you look down long term, I think we're going to be winners because we have the opportunity to engage that customer because of our established footprint of 800, 900, 1,000 stores, and having this name recognition online, so when you Google, you know, women's dresses, dress barn comes up, and a lot of people that you never heard of. So we continue to grow, and e-commerce represents about 10% overall of our sales, and just like I mentioned, it's growing double digits across all of our brands. So a very exciting time. So let me uh, conclude this section by talking about the current reality. Um, we are in a highly, highly competitive marketplace. As I mentioned, we're overstored, and we've got this big disruptor called e-commerce. The industry is mature. It's very difficult to get growth. The, the size of the market 
um, has been growing low single digits or flat, or even in our, our tween market, our girls market, we've actually seen that shrink about 10% this past 12 months. So very challenging. Um, uh, Omnichannel, we just talked about. Uh, not only is it changing the business model, it requires significant capital expenditures. So we have challenges keeping up with someone that's just going in. Maybe they got, you know, a gazillion dollars from some venture capitalist, and now they're setting up this website, and they're looking to gain eyeballs or gain market share, and they're not necessarily worried about making a lot of money. Amazon does, I think it's 36 billion in sales, something like that. Um, but they only make about 100, last year they only made about $100 million. So they're clearly focused on the top line and not on the bottom line, whereas our challenge is to still justify all those stores we have um, while at the same time investing in what we think is the future through um, e-commerce. Uh, and finally, apparel uh, spending is, is shrinking. So when you look at percent of disposable income, um, it wasn't that long ago that it was up around 7 or 8 percent of a customer's or consumer's disposable income was sent on, spent on apparel. So what's happened is as apparel prices have more or less stayed flat over the last 20 or 30 years, what we've seen is that all these other things, uh, like my, my trusty cell phone, smartphone, um, have come along that weren't here 30 years ago. Um, nobody paid for cable charges. 30 years ago, or, or uh, Netflix, also all these new things have come up. And at the same time, the consumers become much more interested in experiences. So restaurants, for example, have had a nice run because people want experiences and, and aren't as attached to fancy clothes the way, the way they may have been 30 years ago. So in this environment, what, what we saw was a great opportunity to continue to grow and leverage uh, our our, our knowledge and our expertise by acquisition. So we still continue to grow our individual brands, but by acquiring other brands, uh, we thought we could um, create a new model for, for what we're calling a retail holding company. So if you look at Asina uh, over the last 10 years, um, what we, uh, you can see the, the, the timing of the acquisitions. Um, uh, Maurice's was about nine years ago. Uh, Justice was almost five years ago, and Lane Bryant and Catherine's were about two years ago. And what we did was very carefully, remember, I'm a venture capitalist, a private equity guy by training. We, we went out, I went out, and looked for those white spaces, looked for those niches that I thought were both defendable and expandable. So when you think about Maurice's, uh, that's a business that operates primarily in small markets. So they're next to like a Walmart supercenter, and Maurice's becomes the fashion destination uh, in those markets, and they continue to grow and have done very well uh, with that niche. Justice owns the seven to 12 year old girl market. Other people sell into it, you know, whether you're Walmart or Target, whatever, they sell that girl, but nobody is focused uh, uh, exclusively on that girl. So the experience that she has in that store is truly unique um, and they continue to grow, and they are uh, the leading market shareholder within that category. Uh, Lane Bryant is just an iconic brand. It's been around for over 100 years, um, and they are the market leader for uh, large size specialty stores. And, and Catherine's uh, is going after uh, the extended sizes. So each of these have a niche, and I believe that each of them can continue to grow and prosper within those niches. So. What it's done for us, as you see, um, it's pretty good things. We've been able to um, grow. You know, the trend line, as, we, as the Wall Street folks say, has been positive. We've had a couple of big bumps in there. Um, we acquired Justice, as you can see, um, at, a at a low. Um, and that was right during the beginning of the Great Recession. So their business had really underperformed. Their stock and our stock had come way, way down they were up, uh, I think, at 45, and <coughs> when we started talking to them, they had dropped to about uh, two. So we had a very strong balance sheet, so we were able to uh, get involved with them, and same again uh, with Lane, Bryan, and Catherine's. So while you know, there's a little uh, bumpiness to this, uh, we think that we're going to be able to continue to keep that trend line going positive uh, because 
we've been able to, in all those exa examples, and we still see lots of opportunity ahead, to create value by the development of this shared service model that you saw referenced um, in the video. So uh, simplistically, what we've done is take the back end away from the brands. So by bringing all that back end stuff, and there are actu actually 21 different functions that we run in our shared service group, and because they're running it for five brands, 50,000 associates, 4,000 stores, we're able to get much more leverage uh, on it. And as a result, uh, we're, we're able to pass those savings on to the brands and, and create synergies uh, for all of Asina. Uh, we've come out publicly at our last investor day and said as a result of the, the merger or acquisition of Lane Bryant and Catherine's and, and the development of this shared service model, uh, we expect to save about $100 million um, in the next two years. So very exciting, a lot of hard work. Uh, but the flip side of it is that by taking all that away from the brands, you allow the brands just to focus on the front end, just to focus on the customer and driving sales uh, and, and creating that <coughs> great experience for the customer to help grow the, uh, the loyalty in, in that business. So um, what uh, I'd like to conclude on, uh, Hazel said, well, tell, tell them about some of your experiences and what your lessons learned are. So here we go. Skills can be taught, talent and values are innate. So when we interview people, we don't give them tests and say, well, you know, how well can you do this spreadsheet? Or let's see if you can figure out this, this challenge, this problem. We want to understand who they are as people and what their innate skills are. Um, so we do, uh, for executives, we do some, some testing, but it's not testing on skills because I, I firmly believe that we can bring those skills up to speed very quickly, and in many cases, we're actually hiring people outside of the retail industry because they're just smart people, <coughs> and they're our kind of people. They have the, the values that we think are important. Whoops. Um, two, over-communicate and be transparent. One of the things we've learned through our acquisitions is if you don't tell people what's going on, they're going to make it up. Okay? They, nobody wants to be left in the dark. And that's how the rumor mill starts. So I get in front of people, town halls, and, and because we're, in, we're in now uh, seven different locations with all our brands, not including the overseas offices, um, and I'll just tell them exactly what's happening. They may not like to hear it. Um, the, the company we bought, Charming Shops, that, that owned uh, Lane, Bryant, and Catherine's owned another business called Fashion Bugs. Some of you may have heard of it. <coughs> and the first day when we took the keys, I got in front of them and said, you know, I'm sorry to have to tell you this, but we're going to close this business, and you're all going to be out of a job. So it wasn't a lot of fun. It's not the message any CEO likes to give uh, to a group of, of associates, uh, but it was, the, it was important to give the message so everybody knew clearly exactly what we are going to do and how we are going to work with them to try and help them in their, their next chapter, but also make it a, a smooth transition. Uh, next, under-promise and over-deliver. Um, one of our, our an former analysts is in the audience, and I think what he would tell you is that um, this is our philosophy with Wall Street. I don't ever want to come out and promise something and then not be able to deliver on it. You know, sometimes uh, stuff happens, and like this winter was a really, really tough winter for most of uh, us retailers, and, and we had to reduce guidance, our earnings projections. Uh, but in, in, and, and we came right out and told them. So again, be, being transparent. But we always want to tell them what we think we can do and then beat it. Next, um, focus. Multitasking is a myth. So even though I know Laurel said she came to listen to me, I see her doing her homework. <laughs> so I know that she's focusing on her homework as she should. Um, but you can't do two things at once. So one of the things that, that we talk about, it, we have you know, all these priorities, all these projects that we're trying to do. And I tell everybody, you know what? We can't boil the ocean. Prioritize those projects and figure out the ones that are going to have the biggest impact on our business. And let's do those first, and we'll get those done, and we'll move on to the next ones. And then last, uh, some of you may remember this from, from um, Ronald Reagan, trust and verify. Don't assume. Make sure you follow up. So just because someone said they're going to get this done, you want to make sure that you're checking on it, not because you don't trust them. You do trust them, but you want to make sure that it actually, got it actually got done. So I do this a lot, and people get used to it. And the more 
they come clean, that they actually say what they're going to do and do it, the more the trust builds. Um, so just to wrap up, um, I, I can't take a, miss the opportunity to talk about the lessons not for business but for my kids. So first and foremost, um, I tell my kids, follow your passion. And we've all heard that, that little quip, um, if you, um, <coughs> excuse me, if you love what you do, you'll never work a day in your life. I love my job. I didn't love my old job, my first job. And so I left it. And I found a passion. And I hope all of you have a passion. And I hope all the kids, your kids, uh, find their passion. Second, learn by observation and inquiry. When you're starting out in, career, in your career, no one expects you to know everything. Ask questions. Uh, three, develop your skills. Just like I was saying before, you know, whatever talents you have does not apply to the skills that you're learning. And th the three biggest ones I would say would be computer skills. So whether that means, uh, you know, how to surf the internet, or more importantly, learning how to use PowerPoint or Excel. Um, two would be writing. I don't mean penmanship. I how to write a letter, how to write um, a, uh, a memo. Uh, it's, it's just awful when you see these kids come out of good schools and they write you a memo or something, and you, s you look at it, and you can't believe that uh, they're college graduates. Um, and, then, and then last, um, although you may not have a lot of examples of, uh, or opportunities in the beginning of your career, public speaking. So public speaking may just be with your boss, or may just be with a small group at a team meeting or whatever. But being able to present your ideas clearly uh, and forcefully uh, in a public setting is, is really important. and only gets more important uh, as you move up. Um, find a mentor, someone you can speak to candidly uh, that's got your back um, and is really going to do the best they can to help guide you uh, as you develop your career. Um, and finally, uh, do your best, because uh, if, if, you're, if you're thinking that you can just kind of skate by the way you did in, uh, in high school or in college by, you know, a gentleman C or whatever, nobody's going to care. When you're working, everybody's watching everything you do all the time. And that's how they're evaluating you. You may not get a report card, but you're certainly going to be viewed based on the quality of your work. Uh, and then finally, have fun. Um, it, life is short, and we should all enjoy it. So with that, thank you very much. I'm going to turn it over. Uh, well, I guess I'll just open up to questions. Thank you. Please. Um, our clothes are manufactured uh, in many places in the world, S some in the U.S., but um, unfortunately a very small percent in the U.S. Most of it is in Asia, Southeast Asia. Um, didn't have anything in Bangladesh uh, during that horrible tragedy. Uh, but we work with different vendors. We have our own sourcing arm. So we've got about 200 people primarily in, in Seoul, Korea, uh, and in Hong Kong. Uh oh, Jimmy. Taking over from any leader is tricky in the best of times, but taking over for your father, it, who is a founder of a company, exacerbates that exponentially. Talk about, if you will, and openly if you can, what the <laughs> challenges were about taking over as CEO and making it yours, but yet still honoring. How much time do we have, Hazel? <laughs> um, uh, it's, a, it's a really, really uh, good question. Um, it was a, um, a, a process. Uh, for the first 10 years, as I said, my father really uh, managed me very well uh, because uh, every time, as I say, I got uh, through something or I would get a little bored, he would just throw me on another project. So uh, it was a really great 10 years. Uh, it also coincided. Uh, with our children. So when I joined Dress Barn, we uh, had our, our first, I think, two months later, something like that. So uh, I was able to kind of stay focused uh, on running the, learning the business and being there for my kids. Now, you know, with, with the five uh, businesses we have, I travel a lot more and not always around as much as I'd like to be. 
Um, so during that time, you know, the trust and verify, my father did a lot of trust and verify, believe me. Uh, and uh, I was able to uh, build the trust with him, not just in working with him, but also in my ability to kind of take his ideas a step further or maybe start developing relationships that could help grow the business um, in, in different ways. And, you know, back then it was a small company, so he could see it happening and people would come to him and, and talk about, I'm sure, the things I was doing. So after 10 years, um, for all intents and purposes, uh, I was running half the business and our merchant uh, was running the other half of the business. So the transition uh, wasn't really a business transition in that I was getting all this extra responsibility. Um, it was really more figuring out the role for my father uh, to play vis-a-vis uh, -vis my um, kind of having the, quote, final say versus his, in the old days, he'd always used to have everything brought to him and, you know, he was the classic command and control entrepreneur. Um, and now, even though the last couple of years before I took over, he was really um, uh, agreeing with 99% of everything I was doing and he was stepping back slowly, uh, it was a, uh, a little bit of a, uh, you know, a, a curb jump for him to be able to really step back. And I think what worked for him was not just that he was still had an office there, he was still in, involved on the board, uh, but that he had so many other interests. Uh, and to, we just celebrated his 88th birthday, God bless him, over the weekend. Um, and uh, he is involved in numerous charitable boards uh, and uh, many other things, investments and personal interests that keep him occupied. I think people that don't have something to turn to, um, you know, it's a lot harder. So I'll leave it at that, and we'll move on. Thanks, Jimmy. Please. So um, do you have a 10-year plan for your portfolio? Um, I, don't, I don't have any plan um, specifically. I just want them to find their passion. And so we're encouraging them to try different internships. Uh, our oldest is now graduating, and so even though she doesn't have a job, we're not concerned. She's a smart girl. She's going to land on her feet. Uh, but I'm encouraging her to try different things and not just go to kind of the classic job at, you know, she worked at New York Times last summer at the New York Times. I said, well, maybe there's other things out there that you're interested in. Look around. So, uh, you know, Laurel this summer is doing a couple of different internships to get exposure and to see how how uh, big the world is and the different things that she might want to do. And hopefully the, something will click with them and then um, it'll lead to a, a wonderful career. Gary? Uh, the company you were a late summer at the e-commerce, how did you adapt to it better by absorbing what they were saying in the economy? Um, I think we were um, uh, late at Dress Barn and Maurice's, the core companies, but fortunately, Justice and especially Lane Bryant and Catherine's were pretty early to the game. So when we've come together the last two years, uh, we've actually got this functional team of our e-commerce leaders. And one of those shared services that we have is digital services. So now what we're doing is collaborating all five brands and our, our shared services group to exchange uh, you know, the best practices. And they say, well, I did this, I did this. So they're all working together to figure out how they can take their business to the next level. And that's why, one of the reasons why I think those businesses are growing, uh, the e-commerce businesses are growing in, in excess of the, the national average uh, for, those, uh, for retail businesses. Back there? How did you come up with the do, do you want the real story or the fun story? <laughs> well, I'll give you the fun story first anyway. <laughs> Um, we, we had a project internally. We were starting up a new company, a new division, and uh, we ended up killing it because we, we took over Maurice's. We just couldn't do both, you know, focus. And we called it, couldn't come up with a name, we just called it Project Venus. I said, Venus, you know, Greek goddess, beautiful woman, it's great. So years later when we wanted to change the name, I said, why, why don't we call it Venus Retail Group? And they said, oh, great, but it's taken. So I said, okay, well, um, another Greek goddess. How about Athena? I said, taken. I said, we'll do some research. So they did some research. And are there any uh, Greek uh, history experts here? Okay, 
Athena had a little sister, and her name was? And she was the goddess of shopping. <laughs> the, the true story is, I, I was looking to change the name, and I happened to have this woman that, that was working with us and, uh, on different names, and she came in, and, and I had my CFO, and I had my head of marketing. So my CFO is, you know, straight as the arrow, and the marketing woman's a little more uh, interested in, in uh, making a statement. So he wanted um, either amalgamated retail <laughs> or standard retail of America, and, and she wanted Bella Luna. <laughs> so uh, we, we ended up with the Cena because it, it had kind of this nice ascending feel to it, and it was a, a neutral word. And unfortunately, as you know, if you've heard of Altria, that's how these things come up now. It's so hard to get a name. But tell, if anybody asks, tell them the first story. Uh, there are two questions there, so let me ask the, answer the second one first. Yes, all of our brands uh, brands have uh, trend or, or fashion uh, people that go to all different markets. Uh, they they also send over their merchants uh, to Europe. In the old days, it was just Paris. Now they'll break up and they'll go to five cities. Uh, they'll go to Asia because there's important fashion happening throughout the world now. So they bring that back. Uh, they use services that do that for a living, you know, just keep feeding stuff in. I mean, the wonderful thing about the Internet is that there's, you know, some big party and they'll take the runway shots and, and you'll have them an hour later and literally uh, two days later some dressmaker will, will have a sample up. So, yes, uh, fashion is global and, and we're very much uh, plugged into it. Uh, the other question is a really interesting one. Fast fashion is in America. So, um, if you've ever heard of companies like Forever 21, mm -hmm. that's what they do. And they're terrific. Um, they've got a big store, a lot of stores all over the country, big store in Times Square. Uh, that store alone, one store, does $100 million. So it's pretty amazing. So their model, um, we call it, maybe I'm a little more cynical, we call it flash and trash. <laughs> so there is definitely a customer for that, um, and I think that they can peacefully coexist. We're going for just a notch. Uh, higher or two notches higher in quality. Um, our our uh, customer wants something that she can put in the, in the washing machine like 20 times and be able to keep wearing it and have it keep looking good. So we choose our fabrics, we do quality control, we make sure that she's going to be happy with that purchase a year later because it's got our label in the back. And if she's happy, she's going to see it and she's going to come into our store. And if she's not happy, she's going to remember not to shop there again. Right, right. Absolutely. Right. Well, you, you might have been overhearing my meeting on Friday uh, <laughs> with our sourcing team. Um, it gets back to what you're saying about fast fashion. So, so those companies, like Forever 21, um, you may have heard of H&M or Zara, operate on more of a fast fashion model. Right. right, speed to market. And it's all about reducing your supply chain. So um, our supply chain is pretty long, depending on, on where you start it. It's you know, six, seven, eight months. Um, and that's kind of typical. Um, and I'd love to shorten it. So what we're working on now are different strategies to, sh to shorten it. We'll never get to, well, you know, for the majority of our goods, you can always have you know, uh, some test things made quickly just to see if it, it's going to hit. And then you can, we call it test and chase. So we're doing that now. Um, but we want to take that six months and try and shrink it by a month, by two months, and there's there's definitely opportunities. I have one other sure, sure. Do you say that huge retailer, growing a massive space? Fabulous retailer.
right? Well, actually, um, at all of our brands, we're, we're um, about 100% private label. So even if we don't develop the product from start to finish ourselves, we have our vendors uh, put our label in it. And depending on the brand, uh, the, the Justice Lane brand, Catherine's brands, are uh, virtually 100% uh, of their own product development. Uh, and the, the, the Lane, sorry, the Dress Barn and Maurice's brands, I can't get my kids straight either, <laughs> uh, are uh, more of a hybrid model and they're, sh they're morphing slowly to be more product development. The difference uh, with our brands, we're a specialty store. So you come in, we have a look. So if you think in your mind's eye of, uh, you know, Ann Taylor, you can kind of see what that look is versus, say, Loft uh, versus uh, in anthropology. They have a, l a lifestyle. And so at our brands, we have the same thing and we're trying to actually amp that up a little bit more in some of our brands. But TJ Maxx, and, and they are a fabulous retailer, it's a different model. They're, they're a treasure hunt. And whatever, the, whatever they can get, they'll get, and they sell it at great prices. Uh, and so you're not sure if you're getting something that was really sold by uh, Polo last year or something that they just mocked up and made a, and just put on the floor and, and you know, put a a price tag on it, that you, you don't know if it has any validity. So it's kind of buyer beware, but it's a great business and everybody can find something in that store. But you never know what it's gonna be. Right, <laughs> right. So um, at the store level, uh, what we do is uh, many things. So first, yes, we depend on the brand. Uh, they may use mystery shoppers. Uh, we also have one of those response numbers. So when you leave, you can enter, you get a coupon or whatever, and you can give your thoughts. Um, and we try and get um, a good a feeling from everyone, what they like, what they didn't like. Um, and then on top of that, um, we have people going out to, you know, district managers going out to the stores to see what's happening in the stores. And, and customers are not shy. Regardless of all these things you have, if they don't like something, they're going to go online, and whether it's through social media or Facebook or whatever. So we have teams at all the brands uh, that uh, deal with those issues. And if something comes up, we're, we're on it right away and, and figure out how to make that customer happy. Oh, uh, good. Happy to hear that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, realizing you're not an economist, but to hear your question to uh, the economist, the consumer will spend more freely the next uh, three years, or is there a structural change where uh, it won't get back to where it was in the uh, mid to late 90s or what's your opinion on that? Yeah, I, I, uh, I do think there's been a change. Uh, our customer is more of a moderate middle income customer. Um, and I, I do think there's been a dramatic change. Uh, if you look back over the last 10 or 15 years, uh, that segment hasn't really kept up with the wealth growth that the upper income has. So that group, you know, if, if, if I were here, you're representing, you know, Saks or Neiman Marcus or whatever, I would be much more bullish. Um, I think our business uh, is going to be very, very tough because there hasn't been the income growth, um, because there is all this competition. And what we see it is trying to take market share. We don't think there's going to be a lot of growth. We don't think they're going to be going back to that free spending ways, um, not just because of the economy and their constraints, but also because they have other things that they'd rather spend money on. Well, each brand is different, and, and what I would tell you, our models are what I would call promotional models. So there is always something going on in our stores. So for example, for those of you who have ever shopped Dress Barn in the fall, we've had uh, what we call BOGO, buy one, get one, a sweater BOGO for, I've been here 22 years, been here for 22 years, and that's, 
um, part of, of the way we do business. So you're always going to be able to walk in and get a, a sweater BOGO. Um, there's a difference between what we call a plan promotion, where you've got the posters that support it. You know, buy, buy two dresses, save $10. That's a poster. That's a plan promotion versus a markdown, which is a mistake. Nobody wanted one arm sweaters this year. <laughs> what do I do with them? I mark them down. So there, you're always going to have markdowns because you just never get it perfectly right. You try and reduce your markdowns, but no one's perfect. Um, and so what we try and do is balance um, the plan promotions, which are worked into our business model, uh, with the minimal number of clearance or markdown promotions. So that's why could you comment on the Um, we, we actually, we had a, a, a summit of all our leaders uh, last year, and we actually did that as a case study. And it was really interesting because when you spoke to the merchants, they said, oh, it was the merchandise that they messed up. When you spoke to the marketing people, oh, they got the marketing message all wrong. When you talked to the field leaders, they said, oh, they did a lousy job communicating with the customer and they didn't uh, bring their store associates along. So what I would say is that, um, that model that Ron Johnson was trying to create had some really great ideas, but it was really terrible execution. Remember what I said about test and chase? Well, you do that with promotions too, and, and you know he just flicked the switch and it, it just killed them. They lost about a third of their sales uh, over a year and a half period. So now the guy that used to run it has come back and he's trying to put some of the disciplines in that were there before and, and keep some of the good things. So I think he's stabilized the ship um, but they've lost so much credibility in the marketplace, and there's so many other choices that I think they're going to be hard-pressed ever to get back to, to their high watermark. Oh, I hope there's nobody from JCPenney here. <laughs> Two questions about leftover merchandise. Uh, the same size here for uh, Dan and Frank for TJ and Mike Again, each brand has a slightly different um, approach. Uh, generally, uh, we rummage it, which means we give it out to a group like Dress for Success. Um, so that's an organization that, uh, that likes taking our career wear because they give it to women uh, who are starting out in the, in the workforce. And then other uh, people take it and they ship it to areas of the country or different areas of the world where um, they don't have uh, clothing. And so it's a, it's a nice thing and um, it's a way to kind of clear the shelves so you get ready for new stuff. Uh, that's a really interesting question because the third wave uh, can really morph different ways. And so we're, we're trying to stay ahead of it. Um, but every week there's a new website. Every week there's a new technology. And trying to figure out which way it goes is going to be really tricky. So I'll give you an example. Um, someday these are going to be three-dimensional. Someday you're going to be able to hit a button and it's going to have like, a, like on... Um, uh, Star Wars, you know, this 3D holograph of some model in a dress. And then you're going to be able to put your avatar, your likeness in there, and you're going to hit the button, and it's going to show you wearing that dress with the, the way it would fit you. And, yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> but does, does that, does that, does that change, if that happens, do people not, not our generation, but does Laurel's generation say, I don't need to go to a store. I'm okay. You know, you go back to that for wave one, peop there were no stores. People had the Sears catalog, and they just ordered stuff, and it came in, and if it didn't fit, they made little adjustments, but that was the, their only choice. So I, I think it's going to be really, really interesting to see what happens, you know, in 20 or 30 years. It won't happen in the next 10 years. Um, and that's why we're, we're spending a lot of money on this omnichannel thing so we can stay current with it and, and we can make that pivot if there should be a new technology or something that, that is going to be transformational rather than just disruptive. How important a role has the 
Um, I think, as I said, the, you know, the, the background in venture capital, being able to identify businesses, um, uh, was uh, talked about that's really important. The other part, though, being comfortable talking to an investment banker, understanding what it takes to buy a company, um, how to get financing, you know, stuff like that. I've talked to some of my peers, and they scratch their head. How would you ever think about buying? Why? How could you do that? Uh, so, having that com comfort and that familiarity. Uh, was, I think, a, a big step up for me in being able to go to my board, and, and it's a, it's a, a cute story. Um, we, we were going to buy uh, Maurice's, and at the time, I mean, we're a big company now. At the time, uh, we were about a $300 million company, enterprise value, and we were buying Maurice's for about $300 million. And um, our directors um, were horrified I said, oh my gosh, this is a bet the company. What if it doesn't work? And I talked about our capital structure, and they said, oh, do it with all equity. And we ended up doing it with you know, a third equity, uh, you know, a third cash, equity in, in the form of convertible debt, and then and a third pure debt. And it worked out um, OK, because I understood and I could explain to them what all those things were. So I'm, I'm getting the, uh, the, the, the yeah. hook here. <laughs> so thank you very much. I appreciate your patience. <laughs> I'm really not. I'm letting us have an opportunity to hear some more in a minute. I wanted to say, first of all, thank you very much for a fascinating uh, conversation with us and letting us learn so much about the whole business, which we uh, buy and sell daily. I'm sure everybody in this room is always exchanging something. And on behalf of the library and of your neighbors and your friends, thank you for what you've done. You. And right, we man. want to give you this as a frame copy of the program. An oh, appreciation for what you've done. That's very kind. Thank and you very And David has been kind enough that there is a reception upstairs at the conclusion, and you can go upstairs and ask some more questions if you want. Only one per person, and <laughs> um, there are refreshments for everyone. We would ask that you please leave by the back of the room, if you could, please, and we'll take David up the stairs so that he can be ready when you get upstairs. And again, thank you very much for coming. <laughs>